Hi everyone, our topic today is the road to Doxis 4.0. I'm Brady Volp, founder of Nimble This and the Volp Firm. This is Get Your Tech On, our show on all things Doxis. With us today are two great guests. First up is Jeff Finkelstein, Executive Director of Advanced Technologies at Cox Communications. Jeff, great to have you back on the show. Oh, thanks, Brady. How are things been? You know, uh, as best as can be expected in the middle of these crazy times we live in. It, it is indeed a new world. Um, up with, second with us is John Downey, the MTS Technical Leader at Cisco G Systems. John, good to have you back as always. No, oh, thanks, great to be here. Celebrating St. Patty's Day for the whole week. Good to see you in green, John. Yes. <laughs> All right, so um, kicking things off. So Jeff, I know um, you have a slide that we'll be going over today, but I, I want to start off the conversation before we get into the road to Doxis 4.0 is what is Doxis 4.0 and is this something that, you know, we should really be excited about? Uh, kind of let's socialize it a little bit. What, you know, is this a new specification? Is it something that uh, we're looking at right now? Uh, is there equipment out there or, you know, kind of what are we looking at in Doxis 4.0? Jeff, I'll let you take it away a little bit. Sure, thanks, Brady. So Doxis 4.0 is, is just sort of the next logical step in the evolution of Doxis. That uh, Doxis, as you know, has been through many phases. It, it kind of came about in the early, not, early to mid 90s. Um, the first piece of data services over coax came from uh, the old MCNS and proprietary solutions, COM21, uh, land city, et cetera. And then it, the uh, Doxis 1.0 spec was born and what came out of that was the ability to have this standardized mechanism for providing uh, these data services over a coaxial transmission medium. Now, some of us, the, uh, the old farts in the crowd, we actually were doing this much earlier. Uh, my introduction to it was actually in the uh, early 80s in South Carolina, where we were using Ethernet over coax in a form of that, if anybody remembers the old vampire tap days, um, and but recognizing that it was proprietary. So if you want things to really gain mass acceptance, you need to do it in an open and transparent way. And that's really what Cable Labs brought to the uh, forefront. So just kind of follow things through. And we were kind of joking about this a little bit earlier that, you know, Doxis 1.0 was the first real uh, standard there. 1.1 was an improvement adding quality of service. 2.0 was uh, added some new physical layer uh, capabilities to it. 3.0 introduced channel bonding. 3.1 um, introduced orthogonal frequency division multiplexing and, and you know, a few other features. And then we realized with 3.1 that there were other things we needed that, as I, as I, you know, said many times that, you know, as a broadband services company, we've always been all about capacity and speeds. Mm -hmm. But customers only buy speed once. They buy services every day. So we needed to undertake this transformation from a broadband services company selling speed to a services company selling the capability of improving and much a much improved customer experience. So back in 2016, whatever it was, I had kind of pitched the idea of Doxis 4.0 to Cable Labs. And what would be included in it would be a way to do these low latency services a way in which we could have a more secured environment with better encryption, a way to add more capacity, either using that one technology, if you would kind of be limited to 1.2 gigahertz as your upper end of the spectrum, and potentially a way to do it to even 1.8 gigahertz. So we, uh, um, there was some, some work that was underway with DOCSIS 3.1, adding in full duplex DOCSIS, adding in low latency DOCSIS and uh, some additional security. So what 
was decided um, as a as a group at Cable Labs was that we were going to take these out of the three one spec, create this new spec with some things that we had added into three one already, like one point eight gigahertz static full duplex, full duplex, low latency doxis, um, you know, and and better encryption, and move that over to a standalone spec, which brought along with it this other effort that um, I kind of started at Cable Labs called Flexible Mac Architecture as a way to provide open interfaces for remote Mac 5. So we brought all of this along and created the DOCSIS 4.0 spec out of it, which kind of gets us to where we are today. So I guess it's it's safe to say, Jeff, that you've had some experience and, and spent some time with Cable Labs on the specification working groups. Is Is that correct to say? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Thanks for reminding me how old I am, you whippersnapper. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, in one form or another, I've been involved in every version of DOCSIS from the beginning, either directly or indirectly as a uh, technologist for my companies at the time. Um, I guess I can take credit or blame, depending on how you look at it, for things like PNM, AQM, DOCSIS 3.1, DOCSIS 4.0, FMA, um, you know, and, and the nice thing about being distance here is, is that, you know, you and JD can't throw anything at me very easily. Well, I, and I think it's, it's important that, that everyone knows there you, yourself and a lot of other people, um, are involved in these standards and it's not like these standards develop themselves. There's a lot of work that goes involved or there's a lot of work that is involved in creating these standards that that you know oh. provide us the DOCSIS specifications that all of us in the industry take advantage of, and also all the subscribers in the industry take advantage of that allow us to have DOCSIS. And you know, starting as you said, the history of DOCSIS one, one point one, all the way up to now, we're going to be talking about DOCSIS four point oh. So you know, I think credit is due where where it's at, and we appreciate all the work that you and everyone else has been doing on the DOCSIS specifications. So. Yeah, thanks for the hard work, Jeff. <laughs> thanks. So. Hey, the uh, I so the only thing I'm throwing at you, Jeff, is shade. <laughs> so if DOCSIS 4.0 piggybacks on DOCSIS 3.1, uh, OFDM, OFDMA, uh, the modulation schemes, what is the only real physical layer difference between besides spectrum allocation? The thing I can see with the chipset would be FDX. FDX is so different in regards to overlapping frequencies and stuff like that. Uh, ESD, extended spectrum doctors, is just really no change to 3.1 except just adding more 3.1 capacity, right? Uh, and the spectrum shift and all that. But FDX is like a total chipset change, right? With echo cancellation and all that. Do you hear or see CPE being one or the other, or they could do both? Do you know? Well, you know, I think I think you're directionally accurate, <laughs> um, but but you know, remember that most a lot of the work that's being done in FDX is done off chip, right? There's a lot on chip, but there's quite a bit that's off chip. Same way with extended spectrum, because with while well, yes, with extended spectrum, it's not just three additional. OFDM blocks in the downstream, it's five additional OFDM blocks in the upstream. So that's absolutely, you know, new silicon needed there. It, it also means more power. So, you know, there's changes that have to occur in the silicon level as well. So they're, they're both equally, you know, complex in many ways. Um, so the challenge is, is that, you know, we had, uh, there were discussions early on about using the same silicon for FDX and ESD. But because of the, you know, almost the, the uh, step functions that were needed for each, and the fact that if you tried to do both in silicon simultaneously, you it, it would be, not twice as complex, it would be four times, you know, even more as complex. So the decision was made sort of early on that, look, just let each one do what it does best. 
you know, that silicon can be, and, and products could be strictly focused on FDX and all of the supporting ecosystem around that. Because it not just it's not just the chip silicon, it's the fact that if you're going to try to do it in a plant, you've either got to build to node zero or you have to have FDX capable amplifiers, which you know can be done. But now they have to have echo cancelers and they have to have dots chips and yeah. you know there's complexity there. ESD is more traditional frequency division duplex. And why even, would I have the extra cost and pay for e for echo cancellation if I didn't plan on using it, right? So I guess my thought was, is there going to be a generic CPE? Probably not. There's not going to be a 4.0 CPE that solves everything. So no, there won't be one size fits all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now the, the the you know the good thing is is that you know a lot of you know the sil silicon at least as far as I know is pin compatible. So you know you do have to add the additional gain blocks for ESD, but from a from a the housing, you know, itself, there's there's a lot of similarity. So it, it shouldn't be a tremendous change yeah. in the in how the silicon is put into the CPE. The, the key thing you said to me that kind of lit a light bulb was some of the FDX stuff, a lot of the FDX stuff is off chip. So the chips could be the same, like the upstream chip could support five to six eighty four, regardless if it's FDX or ESD. And then the downstream chip would support fifty four to maybe one point eight. Uh, and then regardless, right? So it's separate chips anyway. And if you do order FDX, you might have to have echo cancellation and other things in there. No diplex voter, obviously. And then if you do ESD, you'd have a diplex voter. Now, whether or not that diplex voter is changeable, <laughs> that will be the interesting thing. Can I select 42, 85, 204, 396, 684 on the fly? Or do I have to buy a hardware filter, you know? so. Yeah, and that's where we are today with 3.1 as well, right? We have a changeable filter, but there's a limit. It's an 80, it's a 42, 85, or 204. You know, in the 3.1 spec, there's another, yeah, there's a 117 at in 3.1, but I found out that modems don't normally support the 117 filter. So, and, and that causes a little bit of weirdness too. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious about the CPE and I can see where, one size is not going to fit all. It's not like you're going to pick a 4 and, and I think an interesting thing, John, with the CPE is that, you know, the CPE isn't really full duplex. It's half duplex in that full duplex region. Amen. Because, yeah, because you have to, you're either transmitting up or down in that portions of that band. Um, and then it's it's how quickly can it turn from this region is downstream to this region is upstream. You know, particularly as you have many devices and we have, you know, things called interference groups and interference group elongation and things like that. Um, and then if you have amplifiers that have to flip as well, um, there's a lot of, you know, timing that has to be pretty, pretty precise. Okay, guys, I, I, I do want to slow down a little bit before we lose too many of our viewers because we've thrown out a whole bunch of acronyms but haven't really talked about them. Let's start off first with ESD, which is part of the DOCSIS 4.0 specification. And uh, and definitely, Jeff, at any point you want to bring up your uh, PowerPoint slide, let me know. We'll bring that up, but we can also talk about that. So ESD, Extended Spectrum DOCSIS, right? Let's talk Thank about you. that and what it means as part of the DOCSIS 4.0 spec so that everyone who's listening can really understand yeah, what what is what exactly does ESD mean? What's it stand for? Why is it in the spec? What does it buy us? Well, I, as, as you said, Brady, it's extended spectrum doxes, which means that, um, as John said, the upstream in 3.1 is either 5 to 42, North American, 5 to 65, Euro doxes, 5 to 85, what we typically call mid-split, and 5 to 204 megahertz, which is the traditional high split. What we did with four with four O in the upstream is that upstream can be either for that five forty two sixty five eighty five, but two o four. But we also support three hundred three ninety six, four ninety two, and six eighty four. We did have a five eighty eight in there, but decided to take that out. We're also considering taking out six eighty four for a variety of reasons. And, and now, why, then, why is it that we want to do this? Um, because the, the whole idea is that as we strive 
towards the 10G vision, which will, people will see on the slide. Um, I mean, so maybe that's a good time to bring it up. A second, right? Let's not confuse G with gigahertz or generation. 10G for us means 10 gigabit per second, right? Well, the, no, the 10G is, is actually, so when we talk about the 10G, we're not talking gigabits, we're not talking gigahertz. 10G is a collection of technologies that are used to provide a seamless experience all the way down to the customer. So, you know, there's, there's still some- So generically, we're using 10G as a label, but I think 10G meant 10 gigabit per second, because that's what we were striving for in the downstream, right? Was 10 gigabit per second. Yeah, and, it, and it's, it's capable for the most part of 10 gig. 10 gigabits per second, but we look at it as a holistic collection of technology. And then upstream, we're focused what, five? Or we're trying to get five? Um, it depends on where you want to put that split. You know, it, it becomes less, you know, it, it's really, uh, as as I kind of talk about it, well, be, before we get there, let me let me kind of go back to Brady's original point about the the uh, the acronyms. So, so, you know, we use the ESD acronym. So the upstream, as I said, it's 5 to 42, 65, 85, 204, 300, 396, 492, 684. Downstream, um, you know, and that's the, the, in many, in some ways, a, a bigger challenge for folks, some folks, because, you know, plants, for the most part, have, you know, are at 750, 860. Some of us, like Cox, we, were, we build out to one gigahertz. Um, some folks are looking at going to 1.2, but for some of us, you know, if you're at a gig, going to 1.2 is a lot, you know, a lot of expense for little payback. So taking that, you know, we originally started thinking it would be an octave, and we'd go from one gig to two gig. Hmm. Um, but we we kind of realized that there were some constraints around the housings that we were using for taps and actives. Which kind of limited us to to seventeen ninety two or something like and that. And that that limitation being what? Just just where um, just kind of the limitations in the housing itself, where there were suckouts, where so there was just so much loss, you really couldn't go above it. It's basically the physics of, of how much RF part. frequency you can put through those devices before we just run into ugliness of the RF signals going through. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that, so that was, you know, the decision was made, look, we can have one gig, one, two, and then one eight. But, you know, it has to be, um, you know, I, I talk about it in terms of being a one putt, two putt, three putt approach. Because you need to, you know, obviously the fastest and quickest way to get to 1.8 gigahertz is to go to 1.8 gigahertz. But, that is also a very complex and expensive profound um, step to take. So, you know, looking at it and putting it in light of what's going on with the pandemic, with utilization, with the fact that keggers, you know, the compound annual growth rate has increased from, you know, increased by, it's almost doubled in some cases. I mean, if you look at the NCTA website, which collects the data for North American operators, that basically shows that the, the upstream utilization has gone from what used to be 30 to 35% to close to 60%. Annual growth rate. Downstream, and yeah, the downstream kegger um, has gone somewhere from what used to be around 20% plus or minus, it, it was it was in the um, you know 40% range, a little bit more, a little bit less. So, you know, what that means is that things that we were planning on doing over a two to three year window, we had to do in like 12 months, which put a tremendous strain on on our capabilities. And there were things that as operators, we undertook adding additional upstream carriers, more downstream, um, higher order modulations, um, all sorts of things in there. And what that did was that built us, you know, it gave us some time. 
And, and so we were meeting the needs of the consumer. We were adding a little bit extra for those sort of peak utilization scenarios, which then really gave us the opportunity to, to take a step back and look at it and say, how can we you know, minimize the, the steps we have to take to kind of get to this network of the future? And how do we build that network that's a 10 year, 15 year, 20 year roadway? Fiber to the home? Um, so what we did was we, um, Come on, Jeff. you know, we looked at that and, uh, and said, okay, there are these couple of logical steps we have to get. And it's undeniable the long term is fiber to the home. Yep. But that's made of very two rare metals. One's called unobtainium, the other one's unaffordium. <laughs> so, so we need to, you have to be able to monetize and, and, you know, as a business, figure out how do you take your, you know, what we call, uh, you know, EBITDA or OFCF and make those investments into your own network, which then you use, you know, to invest in your own organization. So that is, is sort of how I sort of laid out these. I want things. you to keep going off target. So we're talking but, about but before you do that, John, yeah. but we just got to take a second to go to the chat room because it's kind of blowing up here. So let me take this question from there. Um, so first, uh, I had asked a question about, you know, who's looking at going to above one gigahertz and it's kind of scrolled off already. But Ken Collins says they are launching their first harmonic RFI node tomorrow going to 1.2 gigahertz. I'm really excited to hear that. We already have someone doing ESD. And uh, so good luck at that on your uh, good luck with that, Ken, on your launch tomorrow. Uh, well, shout out to is not ESD. Let's what's not, that? Let's not confuse that. 1.2 we've been doing for a yeah, long time. Yeah, one two is part of the three one spec Brady. Yes, okay. Well it's still ESD it's still above, above one two. gigahertz. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's semi extended. It's S E S D. It's extended semi -extended spectrum. <laughs> shout out to Brian. Good to hear from you. And then um Shout out to Ken and uh, from uh, he's in uh, Anchorage, Alaska. So it's going to be cold when he's doing it. I think. Uh, uh, so Jamie's on Doxis 3.0 joining, and uh, Jamie, thanks so much for the the plug there. Uh, so question from Jamie: Do you guys in the U.S. have symmetrical Doxis? In the UK, for one gigabit per second, you get only 50 megabit upload, and that's the highest tier. Um, so I think that is a question that is really key to what we're talking about in Doxis 4.0 and why I, I, you know, the, the importance of extended spectrum does start to take us into a symmetrical Doxis. Um, so as we kind of, we talk about this more and more, I think symmetry becomes important in extended spectrum, extended spectrum. And um, so I, I kind of want to drill into that a little bit more. I mean, why? Why does it have to be symmetrical? You know, uh, most traffic is downstream. I mean, a lot of this stuff we offer is because of marketing and competition yes. saying, oh, you need one gig symmetrical. No, I don't. Most it, people that would look at their upstream are probably doing 10 megabit. Even but I think, John, you're talking people. about reality, not what people feel and not what like AT&T or competitors are coming in marketing. And so I think those are like the ads where anyone who has fiber higher or is in a competitive environment in fiber fiber operators are now coming in fiber competitors are coming into cable operators and they're not targeting the downstream now they're targeting the upstream so i, I get your point and we don't Jeff need the symmetric fiber. symmetry yeah, as much Jeff as we will, need higher speed doesn't equate to lower latency so when other people come in and say i need one gig upstream to get lower latency no that doesn't fly Right, which is why we have low latency doxes to try to get lower latency, but we still don't need one gig. And I understand the point is it's marketing, it's yeah. FUD, fear, understanding, and doubt. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's how do I how do I capitalize on this, and how do I show that fiber is better? And ironically enough, the speed of light through fiber is slower than the speed of light through coax. Coax is faster than fiber, but fiber has a lot of great advantages besides coax. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't oh, want to get off yeah, that, there, but maybe let's let's go back to the to <laughs> the uh, viewer's question. Um, so the the we do offer symmetrical surfaces, but 
you know, I'm going to kind of blend some things together in, in the answer. So from a, a services perspective, right, there are some, some business services, whether it's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 meg symmetrical, there's a lot of things you can do. Businesses have different needs than a residential customer. Now, one of the, um, you know, hard and fast rules that, you know, we sort of use when we think about you know, products is, is, is that, you know, number one, we really have no control over consumers, how consumers use bandwidth. We sell bandwidth. What they use it for is, is their business. So, you know, you know, whether the customer wants 300, 500, a gig down, you know, whatever it is upstream, our product teams make those decisions. Our responsibility as a technology organization is to help them understand what that means and what it's going to take from an architecture perspective. And I don't care if it's coax, fiber, wireless, 50 up. Well, you know, to tie in what John had said, when you look across a national or multinational view at peak hours, you know, the average consumer today is consuming about five megabits on the downstream and doing about 500 kilobits on the upstream. So it's about a 10 to one ratio. Mm -hmm. The only thing that today can really use a gigabit down at any consistent rate is a speed test. But there are services coming in the future and some customers do have a need for these kinds of very bursty capabilities. So, you know, what it comes back to is you know, as, as service providers, we are in the midst of a transformation. We are transforming from broadband service providers with capacity, right, where everything has always been, you know, back in the day, it used to be, we're offering 10 megabits and the competition comes, we're offering 11. Oh, we're going to offer 12. Oh, we're, you know, and, and that, that can, you know, it's mutually assured destruction. Um, you know, you don't really uh, win speed wars. Customers buy speed once, they buy services every day. So we need to be able to provide the ecosystem to enable those services. And as John said, it's, it's not just bandwidth, it's low latency, it's, low, it's consistent jitter, and it's reliability. So we need to, to take a look at the, you know, the ecosystem, the architecture itself that we use for all of our networks. And cable operators aren't just cable, right? We provide cable, we have fiber services, we have wireless services. And it's how do we enable this across the band? So, you know, whether it's a hundred by, or a gig by 50 or a gig by hundred, a gig by 200, product teams will help with that. You know, something we see with fiber competition as well is we get caught in this conundrum of talking about it's, it's a gigabit symmetrical, two gigabit symmetrical. We're back into the mutually assured destruction kind of scenario. So what we should be talking about, because even though you can get a gig symmetrical, what people buy for the most part on fiber are the same tiers we have on coeds. You know, that they're buying at 300 down by a 30, 50 up or, or whatever is being offered. So, you know, we, we need to think about the services consumers are using right now. It's work from home, school from home. Game from open home. Top video, <laughs> gaming. Yeah, exactly. Right. And we have to figure out how do we, you know, uh, transform the network to meet those needs. Right. Because, I mean, this video stream, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it's probably on the order of three, four, maybe five megabits per second. Yeah. Pretty good qualitatively. So, you know, just putting it in the perspective of that and, and you know, happy to geek out as well, but putting it in the perspective of, of what consumers are asking for and how we as operators can, can change our network to provide them the services that they need, right? That's that to me is, is the bigger problem we have to answer. And, and let me answer from my perspective, the guy's question. And that was uh, his one gig by 50. Now, the typical rule of thumb was a 10 to one ratio because it was easy to do, right? Easy math. 
one gig would be 100 meg up. The problem is in a 5 to 42 megahertz system with 4 ATMA, the aggregate upstream is only 108. So you would offer a 50 meg service from a 108 megabit per second aggregate pipe. And if you look at TCP downstream, to get one gig down, if everything was not optimized and it was worst case TCP, it would eat up about 20 megabit per second of upstream acts. But with act suppression, um, with TCP windowing being better, um, that one gig down might only eat up two meg on the upstream. So you having 50 meg on the upstream should be more than enough to do what you need to do. Um, yes, it always sounds better to have more, but as Jeff pointed out, if you look at real, real usage, it's not nearly as much as you would think. And, and the gentleman, John, was in the UK, so they have a 65 return. Yeah, yeah, yeah so you can do at least six, right? Six eighteen May. They got a little bit better going on there. So, oh, by the way, if you guys like what you're seeing, please hit that uh, subscribe button and a like bell and smash that uh, thumbs up button. We greatly appreciate that. Um, we also, you know, also Abraham said, John, you know, you're talking about latency. He said he'd like lower latency, but he'd also like to have, uh, you know, higher upload speeds would uh, not be too bad. Um, there's also a comment from Tim. He said, it seems that if we have a... DOCSIS 4 ESD CPE and a DOCSIS 4 FDX CPE would cause confusion. This goes back a little earlier in the conversation when we were talking about pin for pin chipsets. Uh, and then we're talking, so uh, uh, Abraham was also saying, when when can we see DOCSIS 4 rollout? 2022? So are there any ideas when we might be seeing this equipment actually coming out? Yeah, and that's really dependent on the availability of silicon. Right. And the, the, you know, I think we could expect some early, you know, uh, availability, possibly in, in late 23, early 24, with probably mass production and, and a much bigger rollout in late 24, 25. Um, you know, remember, as, as John pointed out, that this requires a lot of change to the plant. You have to change out. Your, your passives to either 1.2 or 1.8. You've got to change out actives to support that. You need, if you're going to, if you're considering full duplex, you need full duplex amplifiers. You, you've got all kinds of changes, you know, kind of to the entire ecosystem. You have to decide, are you going to reduce your amplifier cascades? So, you know, it kind of goes back to, um, and, and we touch it on it in, on the slide that I gave Brady sort of like breaking it into bite-sized chunks and how you can you can think about the changes you need to do in order to prepare the plant and get it ready for, for the transformation to DOCSIS 4.0. Because that's and remember, when we were starting to do DOCSIS 3.1, we were deploying 3.1 CMTSs and CPE before we ever turned up 3.1 services. We just ran in a 3.0 mode, it'll be the same way with DOCSIS 4.0. You can run the CMTS, or the in this case, it'll be a remote Mac 5, um, or, or a remote 5 with a virtual CMTS, um, if you're doing full duplex, in a 3.1 mode. And as you achieve sort of a you know certain scale on 4.0 capable CPE, it then makes sense to start turning up the you know, spectrum above 1.2, and you can look at moving your return from a um, 204 to a 396, for example. Uh, but but again, it's got to be done in in bite-sized chunks, and it requires some very very careful planning. I could see it being sur surgically used as well, right? You might just say, "I have an MDU out here. Really, it'd be nice to uh, have a little bit more aggregate capacity uh, out to this MDU." And I'm going to run fiber to a remote five shelf into the MDU. And I'm going to do inside that MDU a 396 upstream. And then I just deploy 4.0 modems in the MDU. So I surgically deployed. I didn't have to do it ubiquitously across my entire plant, right? I can say no, that, that's a great point, John. Um, and, and there was another thing that uh, um, I don't know if it was Abraham, but somebody had said about, you know, boy, I really want lower latency. Mm -hmm. And and I want to uh, make the point about, 
you know, we sometimes we talk about low latency, and what we really mean is jitter, right? Because if if um, you know something, I didn't realize. I'm not a gamer, obviously. I'm, you know, people my age shouldn't be allowed to play games. We should be sitting <laughs> in a rocking chair reading a newspaper, <laughs> uh, a real newspaper. But uh, uh, many times we we talk about low latency, and it's really, you know, when it comes to like video, right? You don't need low latency. What you need is low jitter. Consistency. Consistent jitter, right? And somebody told me, um, a gamer, um, and, and I'm, I'm guessing, you know, I know Brady plays games. Um, he's well known for playing games. But, um, <laughs> of many types. <laughs> of many types. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's the gaming companies, and, and I've chatted with a few of them uh, as well, you know, they correct and they normalize jitter in their own networks so that it's, it's you know, we think about, you know, we really need like you know, 10 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds, or five or whatever that is. But with just using gaming as an example, you know, what they I- They normalize oh, latency. Is that what you meant? They normalize latency so that you, you said they normalize- Well, they normalize latency and jitter. Sorry. Yes, you're, you're right. Okay. So they kind of handle that, a lot of it on the back end. Um, and, and that it's really, it, it's a balance of the two because it's got to be a consistent delivery of packets and it has to be, you know, a reduction in, you know, obviously if somebody's got 200 milliseconds of latency and somebody else has <clears throat> 50 milliseconds, it's 150 milliseconds, which is, you know, enormous in the life of an electron. Um, and it has a big impact, um, you know, I understand on the gaming experience. So what they do is they basically they increase, you know, the the lowest latency person and they bring him up to get him to get them closer, make it, you know, a more fair play at the game. You just don't want someone with a, a, an advantage. <laughs> so the person that has fiber to the home would get uh, more latency added in. Because <laughs> he's gaming against a guy that happens to be on a higher latency link. Yeah, and, and a lot of times, and we don't talk about it, you know, frequently, is that, um, you know, people, a lot of people play games and they're on Wi-Fi. Well, Wi-Fi has got its own inherent latency. So that's another challenge kind of on top of the uh, ecosystem that you have to take into account. Most so games that, that you play will tell you play on a wired connection, not a wireless connection, if, if they are impacted, you know, whether it's Fortnite or any of the games that they actually, it'll constantly tell you, get on a wired connection, it'll improve your gaming experience All yeah, for that reason. Home, we also usually turn on our VPN as well. And now you're encrypting everything. That's, yeah, that makes it worse. More bytes. So yeah, so there's a lot of things going on in the background. People forget about encapsulation, encryption. Um, you're right. I mean, <laughs> a wired connection is going to be best. and uh, not added uh, variables from Wi-Fi and stuff like that. So, yeah, so more in the chat room. Um, also to clarify from Jamie, uh, you know, they're seeing one gigabit per second isn't available in their area. They have 500 by 37. Um, Brian, shout out to you. Thanks for helping moderate the chat room. You're providing a lot of insight there. So you're getting the uh, moderator award this, this one. And then, uh, so... <laughs> Energy one, uh, we all just want more upload. Uh, 35 megabit per second upload is just not enough. So I, I think that's a kind of a reoccurring theme. And so that I think that goes back into the ESD conversation of and any whether it's ESD or FDX, you know, why we're and, and more, I guess it's really more on the ESD, why we're continuing to extend our spectrum. And maybe we want to uh, at this point get into your slide, Jeff and talk about sure. kind of the trail that you're looking at in, in extending your spectrum, because I think you kind of talk about that, how you're doing that sort of in phases. Sure, yeah, we can throw that up. Um, so I'll just, uh, I'll just kind of take you through it, uh, give you a, a snapshot at it. And you know, I think about it in terms of these, these multiple phases. So the first phase was, you know, we took the concept of VSD and got Cable Labs to, you know, we vetted it out with Cable Labs and other operators and vendors and started the spec work. Spec work um, it's pretty much done. It's from a physical layer and a Mac layer. We still have more, you know, there's always tweaking to a spec. Um, 
but it's at the point that uh, you know we have undertaken the analysis of our existing actives, passives, cables, um, amplifiers, customer premise equipment, um, you know, remote Mac tries, you know, coupling the Mac and the Phi together in, in the field. But at the same time, we've we've got this, you know, nobody nobody plans for a pandemic. And, and what's happened is our upstream utilization has, has gone up dramatically. So we've had to do things. And some of us, we've added our fourth or fifth ATDMA carrier in the upstream. We've uh, um, started to add some OFDMA, where we may take one and a half, eight, 6.4 ATDMAs and use a 9.6 OFDMA, because then we can get, instead of eight bits per second per hertz, we can get 10 or 11. Um, so, you know, you're getting another 20 plus percent. Very, very valuable. And that gives us, you know, some headroom there. Is that 20 plus percent upstream speed that you're referring to? Or what, what is that? It, it's percent? upstream capacity, total capacity. Okay. So we're, we're yeah. starting to get more speed in the upstream. Is... We, we are, yeah. And that's really the, you know, the, the, you know, my kind of my whole concept with 4 was to get the upstream, um, you know, into the, the three, you know, total capacity, three, four gigabit range. So you could be offering two gigabit speeds or three gigabit speeds. In the upstream. In the upstream. That's yes. awesome. Yeah. And, and so, but it takes steps to get there. So, you know, to kind of follow along the top timeline, um, that was done very professionally there, by the way. We have a uh, professional orchestrator that handles this. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I've heard. So I've heard. Um, so when you continue along the top, you know, we've now got to undertake, uh, you know, you, for folks that follow it, 1.8 gigahertz capable passives are now starting to um, be available for, for lab testing. Mm -hmm. Actives maybe later this year as well. So we've got to begin testing these and understanding um, what has to happen in terms of transmit power, total composite power. Do you need to do a step down and, and you know, drop some, some transmit levels above one gigahertz or 1.2 gigahertz? You know, we can model this stuff forever and we've been modeling it for probably five years or more now. But until you actually get equipment, you don't really know how it's going so to be. Jeff, I, I have to address the elephant in the room, and that is, why do we even care about going to 1.8? I know what the answer is. I want to hear you I, I didn't realize that was an elephant. I thought we... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Most of us how understand we, that. We it's focus? just you. <laughs> why, are we focus, why are we focus so much on 1.8 when the only reason we're going to 1.8 is to open up the upstream? Why are we not focused on the testing that's going to be needed to do a 396 upstream? Well, that, that's going on. That's simultaneous. So I could see a 396 500 split and still stick with 1.2 gigahertz downstream. Sadly, that doesn't work for a number of reasons. Number one, the consumption continues on the downstream, and that growth is, is running rampant. Additionally, our product teams have requirements for achieving more downstream speeds. So no matter how much we split nodes over a period of five, seven years, we still cannot keep up with the longer term growth that we're seeing in the downstream. Do you have so the way to address it is the way we've always done it, which is spectrum. Do you, but you have spectrum that's not efficiently used today. Or do you have plans to get rid of single carrier qualm? Over time, yes. But even if we get rid of that, and the video. models are still very clear. And that, that buys us some time, but it doesn't provide that long-term strategy. But let me throw a number at you. If I did a 396 split, and I could do 3-1 OFDMA, OFDM, with no other single carrier qualm, I estimate I could get about 3 gig on the upstream and 7 gig on the downstream. So the question would be, is that enough? And that also assumes it's all three one, right? It's all IP video. It's there's no single carrier qualm. I know I'm. This is my utopian world, I guess, right? Like I'm moving in, but would that be enough? And I wonder 
is seven gig enough? Or by the time we get rid of our synchronic qualm, 20 gig is needed. Yeah, I don't know. So, you know, there's no, I mean, seven gig is enough for a period of time. Okay. But for the amount of money we're going to spend to do that, right, we can spend a little bit more and double the lifespan or triple the lifespan. And future proof yourself. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and it, it's a way of ex- now, you know, and all of this, you know, generationally is to get us on the road. Um, you know, by the way, the road to utopia is fraught with many pitfalls. <laughs> um, it's <laughs> utopia. Lots of mistakes. Is, yeah, Utopia is uh, is a moving target. Um, unless you're Todd Rundgren, if anybody knows Todd Rundgren, you'll get the reference there. And if you don't, look up <laughs> another good Philadelphia guy. Um, so, so I mean, your point is, you know, and John, honestly, we've looked at that. We've looked at changing the split, you know, because if you're at 396, like you said, right, you know, taking your 25% dive flexor um band and and you start at 500 so now you're 500 to 1.2 could be seven gig down it could be three gig up maybe a little bit more but for the amount of money you're going to spend to do that because now you got to change your die flexors you got to change your high end you got to change your amplifiers well well you have there's to change, a lot of changes you have to do but for the same money you can get 396 and 1.8 but the 1.8 forces me to change out taps. If you're you're going to change taps anyway. My, but, but if I'm already at 1.2, a lot of people besides Cox are at one point. There's a lot of people at 1.2 now. Taps, amplifiers, their spacing is proper. So the fact that I don't have to go to 1.8, that could save me a lot of money. It's, but, but you have to get there eventually because that you're either going to be splitting the nodes down to increase the upstream capacity or downstream capacity, because you are going to run out. Today it's upstream, but tomorrow it'll be downstream. Tomorrow being, you know, rel- relativistically three to five years. So now I've got to spend more money. I got to split nodes, which directionally is not a bad thing, but you still have all the legacy video. You have single carrot qualms. You've got, you know. You know, you still some folks still have the out of bands, the 55 one, 55 two. This is the analysis paralysis, right? We have to analyze every single aspect and then we just get paralyzed by the whole process. Well, you know, honestly, many operators have analyzed it and have made the decision either they are going to go a full duplex route at 1.2 or they are going to go the 1.8 ESD route. So, you know, there's many. Um, you know, the tier ones and tier twos that have already made their decisions. So it's a given. It's kind so of who, a given. Yeah. Who, who are the um, who are the hardware vendors, Jeff? Can you, because uh, I, I mean, maybe we get some of them on the show. It'd be great to talk to them. No, I mean, it, it's the usual cast of characters minus one. <laughs> gotcha. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so you know, they, they, we, you know, we, we have these discussions quite honestly daily. Um, and, and it, you know, may not be bad, um, you know, cause they've, you know, many have already made their commitment to. I think, I think Jeff Brady was asking for the hardware vendors, not for the MSOs that are in different camps. So the hardware vendors. I was referring to the hardware vendors, yeah. the OEMs. Yeah. Like who's making the equipment, I guess. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, you know, like I said, everybody except, Every operator, or every every vendor minus one is kind of committed to four up. Good. Um, so you know those would be good logical folks to consider. Cool. You know, and and the operators have made their commit not commitments, but you know we are all kind of moving in a in a very similar direction. And I, and I do want to fall back up because I didn't think I got a closure on. Uh, I think it was Tim that asked the question about: Are we going to end up with two CPEs, one that's like a, an FDX modem and one that's an ESD modem, or do we see that being just one CPE that supports both? You know, it's likely going to be on a per market or per operator basis because, you know, I don't think operators are going to do both FDX and ESD. So if you are in a market that is a single operator you know, that the modems that would be available are gonna be the FDX modems. 
if you're in a market with an operator that has taken an ESD path, the retail modems will be the ESD capable modems. You know, it's like, it's no different than the three one days where if you would go to the store and you would buy a four by four modem, but if you would go the next week, it would be an eight by four modem, right? You can still use the four by four, but you're not gonna get all the capabilities of the eight by four modem or the 16 or 32 by eight modem as they became available. Right. So it's, you know, from a retail perspective, consumers have to be careful, you know, to know what they're buying and make sure that what they're getting is fully compatible with their service providers network. So long story short, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> answer that question, yes. There will be two different modes probably. <laughs> so Energy One asked this question and John and I have talked about this before, Starlink. Um, so that's the uh, Elon Musk satellite in the sky that provides internet. So he says, curious what the impact Starlink could make if, uh, if it came down in price. And uh, here's what your thoughts are on that, Jeff. You know, I, I mean, honestly, I'm a, I'm a Starlink fan. Um, I think there are many customers that are underserved. And even with RDOF, the rural distribution over fiber, um, you know, funding by the government, and, and we're all doing our best to get high-speed internet to those that have been underserved. Um, if they are able to get a qualitative service from the satellite, because I, I've, uh, you know, done some testing, honestly, with Starlink as well. And um, it it's, gets a consistent kind of like 100 megabit down and, you know, 20 megabits up. Um, I know some folks that have it and they're getting 200 down and 20 up, 30 up. And, and you know, to me, anything that can improve the customer's experience with access to the Internet to be able to get access to work from home, school from home, home health care, I, I think it's I think it's great. And and the the more we have there, you know, the 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 better off as an industry we are, because it's really not, you know, yes, yeah, we do want to make money at doing this, but in the end, it's really in, you know providing an improvement of services to the, to the customers so that they can access the services in the best fashion they can for where they live. So yeah. I, I don't, you know, that Starlink doesn't worry me, 5G doesn't worry me. You know, I, I mainly, from my perspective as a, you know, the chief access scientist at Cox is what does it take to, to give a qualitative experience to the consumer? And, and if we can't do it, I want somebody to help those customers and give them what they need. I saw Sam Knows is doing testing as well. So Sam Knows is well known about testing pretty much everybody to kind of hold us to the, our feet to the fire and say, you know, are you providing the speed you say you are? And they're testing latency as well. I don't know if you tested latency on the, the Starlink, uh, but I mean, it didn't look too bad. Nope. I mean, I'm, I had satellite through HughesNet and it was it was painful, very painful. Uh, but that's 22,000 miles above the equator. Now the low Earth orbit is only like 300 miles above us, you know. So I'm uh, I'm curious as well how well it holds up to uh, clouds, snow, heavy rainfall, the stuff yeah. that affects satellite, you know. Yeah, I mean I, I I know a lot of the folks. I come from a satellite background, um, and the LEO stuff. You're an alien. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, the LEO stuff is, is it's quite honestly, it's, it's, it's very good. Um, you know, whether it's 300 miles or 22,000 miles, that's a synchronous versus geosynchronous orbit. Um, you know, they've done some brilliant things with Starlink. And it's not just Starlink. There's others out there. There's Project Kuiper with Amazon, um, you know, that are in, looking at getting into the same game. Um, I... I you know, I, I hope that it that it works as well as they say, because there's a lot of folks yeah, um, that that will really be able to be helped with those services. Internet is like a utility. How could you say it's not right? At some point, there will be like your <laughs> life, liberty and, and free will and all that. I need water, I need electric, I need telephone, I need Internet. Yeah, it's, and it's it, like a utility. 
And, and I think your philosophy, Jeff, is spot on. And I think a lot of us in the industry feel the same way you do, that you know, our goal is to deliver the best services that we can to the customer. We all run into troubles and, and whatnot, but you know, if we can't do it, this, you know, we, we're, we work as hard as we can to deliver the service. And if we can't, someone else will do a better job at it. And that's, that's, the, way, that's the way it is in, in, in everything, in industry, in life, in capitalism. So we do the best we can. You know, and it's, it's, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I find interesting is, is that it's, you know, it's, it's unreasonable customers asking for unreasonable things that cause us to do, you know, unreasonable responses in an unreasonable time, Yes. you know, and, and this, it forces us to be better at what we do. And that's a challenge. I mean, you know, as a technologist, I welcome. Yep. Um, because, you know, when you go back to the early days of Doxis, it was a megabit down and kilobits up. And look at where we are now, 25 years later. You know, we have some folks offering two gig down, 100 meg up. And here we are talking about offering a four or five gig down service and a two or three gig up service over the same infrastructure. Yep. It's, it's, a, it's amazing how far we've come. You know, I don't think we give ourselves enough credit for that. And we still have room to go. And, and the final th thing to talk about, we'll just spend a minute on this. Tim LaSalle asks, you know, we've talked about 1.2, 1.8 gigahertz, but what about three gigahertz? Because that is something in, I, I think you call it the ultra, when we, when we look at ultra high frequencies, is three gigahertz on the table still, Jeff? So, you know, the, uh, um, some of this falls in John's space more than me, being the Phi guy. Um, but, you know, we found that if we go above 1.8, we need to do mid-span boosters because of the, you know, the, it's the, you know, it's, it's the um, I squared R kind of problem. So that as you go up in frequency, you have more attenuation, it takes more power, and you fall down pretty rapidly. And what you need to do is put like a mid-span amp in to boost it, because some of those runs are, are 300, 400, 500 meters between amplifiers. So is three gigahertz possible? Absolutely. Um, you know, we actually, I started a three gigahertz task force at SCTE, and we're talking about how do we do three gigahertz. But there's a far cry difference from the physics to the reality. Yep. And and it's going to be up to folks that really know the outside plant to figure out where do we put in these mid-span boosters, because you get to violate many laws in life. The well, laws of physics are not one of them. Yes, sir. I, I feel like fiber has to keep going deeper. There, you're not going to keep trying to make an N plus five solution work, and and put all that money into it. And then it's like, why? Why did I do that when I could have? Uh, put fiber a little bit deeper. Now, if I put fiber through the home, that's a little bit hard to swallow cost-wise. Some people would say just the drop to the customer's house could be more intrusive and hard to work on than the hardline plant. But if I can run fiber to a tap and that tap is an RPD, maybe I can do three gigahertz from there. And it's still cheaper. And having eight people share an RPD, so it's an eight person service group, than trying to do a one person service group which is Jeepon Ebon, yeah, if, if you get what I'm going at, you know? No, no, I do. And, and it's a, it, it would it, be a dream. It, it, thank God. Yeah. 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 All right, gentlemen, we've got to wrap this up. This was a great session. Jeff, fantastic uh, uh, overview on where we're at on Doxis 4.0 and John, great, uh, great information as well. Anything you guys want to plug before we shut it down? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, SCTE papers. Yeah. Get your SCTE uh, papers in, folks. They're abstracts due by April 10th, I think. Yes. So if anyone's going to submit, it's supposed to be by April 10th. The show is in Atlanta live this year, October 12th? No. It, 12th or 12th? I thought it was later. But, it, yeah, it'll definitely be in Atlanta. But, you know, as far as we know, it's going to be a hybrid event, you know, in person and virtual. Um, it all depends on your comfort level. But yeah, like, like Brady and John said, get your papers submitted. Um, there's a number of working groups we've started at, at 
CT related to Doxis 4 technologies. If you're interested, please come join. Um, you know, fun time guaranteed. Yeah, absolutely. And Jeff, do you know if the hybrid idea means they will just broadcast out live events or where they also have like remote people doing WebExes or Zoom? Because I think yeah, that's- I, a good I don't idea. think it's been decided yet, John. Yeah. They're gonna okay. wait and find out how things yeah. play out yeah. between now and then. All right, gentlemen, thanks for your time. Thanks everyone so much in the chat room. It was a great discussion. And uh, Brian, again, thank you. You did a great job co-moderating. Everyone, so long. Our next episode is April 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern, Eastern Daylight Time now. Uh, more on troubleshooting OFDMA. So please join us then. So long, everyone.